gracias. Eh, por motivos de flojera, voy a hablar en inglés, pero perdóname. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for having me here. I, I talk to groups, I work with companies all over the world, and I just have to say totally honestly, uh, this is one of my favorite places to be. Uh, with doing some, doing one of my favorite activities in the world. So I, I couldn't be more excited to be here with you today. I have been coming to Colombia for 18 years. Um, first trip here was in the year 2000. And the driver picked me up at the airport in Medellin, which as you guys know is up over the hills. And the driver said, you might be Maybe you lie down in the back seat and I'm going to put this coat over you just to be safe. And uh, I just want to share that very brief image because if anybody doesn't think that transformation or world-class innovation is possible right here in Colombia, Colombia itself is one of the most amazing acts of innovation that I think anybody could point to in the world in the last 20 years. It's an amazing story and you guys are part of it. Um, what are we doing? Actually, let me start differently. I, I, have high, I have high expectations for today and I hope you do too. Um, I hope today challenges you. I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that it empowers you with ideas and tools and concepts that you can actually use to go out and change the world. There's three parts to what I want to share with you today, and I, I hope it does all three. I hope to challenge you, I hope to maybe inspire you, and hopefully to empower you. The first part of what I want to do is I, I do want to challenge you. There are a few activities in the course of human endeavor that can actually transform the diversity of our humanity and magically convert that diversity into community. Sometimes sports can do that. You know, the Olympics, for example. I, I, I learned this weekend that a royal wedding can potentially do that. Something else that has the power to transform our diversity into community is the amazing creative act of entrepreneurship. And that's what excites me most about entrepreneurship and about innovation, is it has that transformative power to take the diversity of our humanity and turn it into community. And so my challenge to you, as entrepreneurs building businesses, is this. Don't just create something that is successful. Create something that is meaningful. And what that means is that your great business ideas should be guided by and animated by a positive moral purpose that enables your ideas and your acts of innovation to create a future that is different from the past and one that brings us together as people, bridges our differences, creates opportunities, and fills people with hope. Entrepreneurship can do that. By contrast, a business that lacks a positive moral purpose really is just an empty shell, unfulfilling its true potential to transform and to unite. And it can actually do just the opposite, and we have all seen that, which are businesses that reinforce differences of class and race and, na and nationality. My point is that what we are doing, what you are doing, matters. The businesses we are building, they matter. And how we do it matters. So my challenge to you today and going forward is not simply to create something that is financially successful, but to create something that is truly meaningful. Amen. Okay.
That's part one. I hope you take that with you. I wasn't planning on saying that, but it struck me that it was important and it matters. I hope you will take it with you. The second part of what I want to say is I, wa I want to make the case that there has never been, there's never been a better time to start a company or to start a new business. Uh, I've been, for the last seven or eight years, I have been coming to Columbia. We have been helping large companies create amazing new growth businesses. I met just this morning with a, for a colleague from Protection who showed me a business that we incubated several years ago. Entrepreneurship exists in startups, but it can also exist inside large companies. But I want to make the case, and I hope you will agree with me, there's never been a better time or a better place to create the future, to innovate. If you simply think about Think about some of the things that today we take for granted, that yesterday I went to a meeting in New York City, it was an important meeting, I got in a car with some stranger I'd never seen before, he perfectly reliably drove me to that meeting, I got out and I didn't pay him a cent. That seems like inconceivable and yet the largest mobility company in the world owns no cars. The largest hospitality company in the world, Airbnb, owns no hotel rooms. The point is, is there's things that we take for granted today that 10 years ago would have been unimaginable, inconceivable, and yet today we take them for granted, and the pace of change is only accelerating. These are probably, some of these are too small to, 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 to read the subtext, but I simply want to point out that there are massive transformations remaking the worlds and the communities that we live in. 40% of the workers in the United States in a few years are expected to be participating in the gig worker economy, the independent worker economy, transforming not simply the workplace and the way people work, but the way that they live, the way that they bank, and all of the needs that accompany their daily life. There are massive shifts, and this is something we've studied extensively, at the intersection of technology and consumer behavior. These are bigger and more enduring than trends. And I'm not going to speak through each one of them, but all six of these forces that, as I say, represent intersections of technolo technological innovation and consumer behavior change, customer behavior change, create both challenges and opportunities for the future. What does that look like? It looks like new businesses taking entirely different approaches to business models, and the point of these value creators is not that they are digital. The point is that they are enabling amazing experiences for their customers and that large companies that cannot transform with this speed, those historic and legacy flagship brands that we all grew up loving run the risk of becoming ghost ships. But it is not a fait accompli. There is an opportunity for large companies to transform themselves. This is a specific story of one of the biggest banks that we're working with right now in the United States. And they may see their current business fairly traditionally. We help people transact, we help them store assets, we provide credit, but we're very conscious of some of the forces of change that are transforming their business as the nature of work transforms, artificial intelligence transforms uh, decision making, and that our data becomes as important an asset class as our finances. What a concept. And think of the massive innovation and growth opportunity areas that emerge when we see the future through these lenses that are shaping, uh, shaping the future, the, 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 the environment of possibilities in ways that we've never imagined. We are working on projects of how do we help people? How do we help people who suddenly find themselves in a situation where their income is coming from six different sources at the same time? rather than one. Can you help me as an institution manage my personal data when that is an asset that's actually more valuable than my financial assets? 
These are amazing challenges, but huge opportunities. This may seem crazy to you. This is a company I've worked with for a number of years, Colgate. You can only buy this toothbrush at the Apple store. That might sound like a gimmick, that might sound crazy, but when your toothbrush is connected to your Apple health menu on your watch and it can tell you in real time data about your plaque content and whether or not you're developing gingivitis and if you need to go to the dentist, that's potentially useful. Imagine when this is connected to a network of dentists in third world rural countries such that Low-income people who are using this toothbrush are able to access dental care without them even knowing it. That the dentist knows that you have a cavity before you do. These are amazing things that are happening even from very, very, very traditional companies. So I hope you will agree with me that, that there's never been a better time to innovate. And what are we doing when we're innovating? I've used this phrase. We are creating a future that is different from the past. And so this is really the third part of, of what I want to talk about, is the very specific, how do we do this? What are the tools and techniques and ideas that you can take away from this next 34 minutes and five seconds and use as you build your businesses? to dramatically de-risk that innovation journey. Well, first is to understand what is it that we're actually doing because when I go out and talk to business builders, whether those are early startup entrepreneurs or they are managers in large corporations, we typically very quickly find ourselves in a conversation about, oh, that's, this is terrible. Um, very self-promotional slide, yes, but um, we talk about products and services. We talk about the benefits and the attributes of our offerings and the associated economics that make them available to our customers. Those may be external attributes and artifacts of our enterprise. But when we innovate, what we are actually doing is we are enabling our customers to make desired progress in their lives. We are enabling them to achieve desired experiences. We are enabling them to create meaning that was historically unavailable to them. The essential unit of innovation work is progress. We enable people to make desired progress and create desired experiences. The attributes of our offerings are simply artifacts, but they shouldn't be the focal point of our innovation work. To emphasize this point and make it a little bit less conceptual and a little bit more practical, what is it that new products and services do? They do something very specific. New products, new services, they, they resolve very specific circumstances of struggle, and they fulfill unmet aspirations in people's personal or professional lives. Successful innovations enable progress. That's what they do. They may or may not use high technology. They may or may not be wildly differentiated from other offerings out there. Those things don't matter. What matters is are you enabling progress that is historically difficult for people to achieve are you enabling people in their personal or professional lives to create desired experiences that have historically been difficult? If each of you took out a piece of paper and scratched out your own definition of innovation, these words probably would not be violently in conflict with them. But what I can promise you is that this notion of making a specific circumstance making a specific circumstance in which a person is trying to make progress in their lives. And just to be clear, if you're in a B2B business, no company has ever bought anything. Only people buy stuff. So disabuse yourself of this notion that you're selling to a company, you're selling to people, unless you're in some kind of a programmatic training environment where you really are dealing with a disintermediated robot which increasingly is the case, but even those have people behind them. 
My point is, is that successful innovations focus on circumstances as the essential unit of our innovation work. And that idea that we focus not on the attributes of our offerings, uh, but on the circumstances in which our customers are trying to make progress, that's a different mindset. And it requires a different skill set. And so those are the specific things I want to talk about. How do we shift our mindset from thinking about what are the right attributes and benefits of our offering to what are the dimensions of experience that are relevant to a given individual in that moment, in that situation in which they are struggling to make progress. This is the big shift that we have to make mentally and conceptually. It is from the view of the world of products or services to a lens of the world that views external phenomena through this construct of the job to be done, which is the subject of the book that Clay uh, Christensen and Karen Dillon and I wrote. And it's a key shift mentally in terms of actually designing and execute, developing new products and services that are predictably successful. What does that look like? I'll use the case of one of my colleagues who bumped her car into another car in the parking lot recently, and we were actually on the, in the, at this time working for one of the big banks on a project. And so we were joking and we said, well, what would client X offer you? You need some money to fix your car and fix the car you bumped into? They'd offer you a loan, use your credit card. And so we started thinking about, well, what could she actually do? What she actually ended up doing was borrowing some money from her roommate. But, but through the lens of that circumstance and all the different ways that Alyssa might have generated a little bit of money, she could have sold a table that she didn't want. She could have picked up a few extra rides on Uber. She could use Catalan to find a, a, a gig or short-term piece of work. She could have sublet a spare bedroom. Uh, in a world in which our consumption is increasingly based on subscription rather than transaction, monitoring our subscriptions is an increasingly relevant way to think about financial planning and control. There's a ton of things that Alyssa could have done. But the bank really only offers her one. Take out your credit card, right? Maybe come in for a loan if it's enough money. But that's an incredibly narrow and incomplete way to think about the business that the bank is actually in. So there's this conceptual shift that we need to make from a product lens to a jobs to be done lens where a job is defined as the progress, the progress that an individual seeks in a given circumstance. And when we unpack those circumstances, this is, you get to channel your inner, your inner Steven Spielberg. Imagine you're shooting a scene. There's a who, there's a when, there's a where, it's a specific circumstance. There's some desired progress, there's current behavior that you can identify, and there are not simply functional struggles like inconvenience or uh, uh, something being too expensive or too complicated. There are rich emotional layers of circumstance and struggle and desired experience, and there are almost always social dimensions, meaning what do I think about, what is everybody around me thinking about me? My workplace colleagues, my boss, could be my kids, my spouse, my neighbors, random people on social media who are making fun of me because my cat is fat. I don't care that the cat is fat. Um, right? These things all matter. And to the extent that we get trapped up in thinking of our product as a differentiated set of functional attributes and associate economics, we completely miss the potential value that we might be creating in the world, and one of my favorite examples of this comes from our longtime friend and collaborator, Scott Cook, who started a neat little company, it's not so little anymore, called Intuit. And one of the stories that Scott loves to tell is that when they started Intuit and they had this little product that was really designed just for poor people like me who wanted some help keeping track of their cash and, and making sure we were paying our bills and not running out of money, and for several years, Scott and his team knew that people were using this at the office. They were using it at their workplace. And they got this from surveys they were doing um, uh, and some basic 
uh, lightweight customer research that they were doing. And they just sort of ignored that as that's kind of weird. I wonder why they're doing that. Maybe they must be doing their personal finances on company time. But when they finally sp spent time immersing themselves with these people to understand the very specific circumstances in which people were using this and the struggles that they were encountering, what he found was it wasn't at all what they had thought. These were, these were small business owners who simply wanted to focus on building their business and not have to worry about running out of cash. They, they tried some of the small business accounting software and it scared the crap out of them. They didn't understand the language, they didn't understand the functionality, double entry bookkeeping and, and, and balance sheets and cash flow statements and income statements and it just, it actually made them more anxious than they were beforehand. But this simple little cash calculator, boy, that was perfect. So what did Scott and his team do once they realized that? He said, we redesigned our product. It had half of the functionality of the competitive small business accounting software. We, it had half the functionality and we sold it at twice the price. And in a matter of months, we dominated the market. And that's what became their their, their best-selling product, QuickBooks. Half the functionality at twice the price. That's a good business model, right? And, and, and then they, they, their TurboTax tax prep product, one of the key insights behind that is that nobody actually wants help with their tax preparation. No one wants to get better at that. They actually want taxes to go away. It's like Gabrielle and I were talking this morning that if you want a home, nobody actually wants a mortgage, they just want a house. And so we, we consistently and very smoothly confuse our products with desired progress. They're not the same. A mortgage and a house are not the same. <laughs> I can't live in a mortgage. Right? Most of my big banking clients in the United States and in Europe where we're working with the banks, uh, most of them have credit card businesses and they think that people want credit cards. Well, if you talk to most consumers, they don't want credit cards. They hate credit cards. We actually work with Goldman Sachs to create a multi-billion dollar business called Marcus, which is really about helping people get rid of credit cards. So focusing on this unit of our innovation work as the circumstance in which people are trying to make progress is a, is a very different mindset that we need to apply to our innovation work. And it does require, as I say, not only to think differently, but to behave differently because one of the hardest parts of this, especially in an age of big data and where friends of mine like David Kenny, who runs IBM's Watson business, and his, his Watson, they can diagnose cancer, Watson can diagnose cancer, uh, most types of cancer with much greater accuracy than the best trained doctors in the world. And it's amazing what technology can do. At the same time, when we are looking for those deep insights that enable successful and transformational innovation to take root, the data we actually need is the data that reveals those very specific struggles in which individuals are trying to make progress. Stories are the data behind the numbers. Most of my clients have a near religious faith in the power of math, forgetting very conveniently that the reality that we all live in is messy, and unstructured and fundamentally narrative in its quality. And so if we want to create products that people predictably pull into their lives to make progress, we actually need access to the raw data, not, synth not synthesized, smoothed, aggregated averages that remove the rough edges where opportunity actually lives. 
We need access to the raw data of the stories of people's lives struggling to make progress. Behind every great innovation is a simple, compelling story of a person trying to make progress in their lives. Good innovators are almost always overwhelmingly great storytellers. I want to ask you to answer this question. I've been working with Endeavor for 20 years, really since before it started. And this is a bit of a confessional. One of the things that I've been asked to do and I've enjoyed doing with Endeavor is, is these mentoring sessions where I'll get an hour to spend often with a phone with an entrepreneur from some um, building some amazing company in some remote part of the world. We'll have one hour and I'm supposed to be valuable and useful to this amazing business builder. And typically it takes me somewhere between 50 and 55 minutes to actually understand what business they're in. And I really started feeling like a bit of a fraud and a failure. Because I had like five minutes to say something useful and in five minutes you can just kind of say like, you know, good luck, you know? That's not very valuable. <laughs> they don't need a hug, they need help, right? And, and so I started to say, well, what, what was happening? What actually was the experience that enabled me to make that switch and understand, aha, now I understand what business you're in. And what I realized is that we typically would waste massive chunks of our conversation with the entrepreneur telling me about the benefits and characteristics and performance qualities and magic of their solution. But it wasn't until they could tell me a story about their customer in a specific circumstance trying to make progress that I actually understood the context and the why behind the what of their innovation. And so my challenge to you, and I encourage you to do this, if it's easy to answer, that's great. If it's hard to answer, all the more valuable. Answer this question with a story that you are not in. Answer this question with a story about your customer in a specific circumstance trying to make progress in their personal or professional lives. And then you can end that story and say, our job, the reason we exist as a business is to turn that story of struggle into a story of progress. If you can answer this question in which you are not the star of the story, the star of the movie, you are on your track to creating a business that is actually valuable in the external world. I'll very quickly tell this story of a friend of mine who created a condom. I very intentionally use examples from all kinds of industries in different parts of the globe. But this is a good friend of mine who built a, a condominium, a, actually a housing business in Detroit in the teeth of the recession. And he thought this was going to be a good business, even in Detroit, because he knew there was lots of uh, older people who wanted to downsize their homes. They wanted to get rid of those expenses and the maintenance and the hassle. They had kids, right? Uh, what do you call them? It's um, nieto, vac nieto vacío? Nieto vacío? Empty nesters? Yeah. Nido vacío, shit. Yeah. Nido vacío. Nieto is otra cosa, yeah. Nido vacío. Yeah? So he went out and he spoke to these people and he said, you know, what do you want? I know you want to downsize. This big house is driving you crazy. You don't want the maintenance and the hassle and these empty rooms to clean and stuff. And he built exactly what they wanted. And what do you think happened? Nothing. Nothing. He was like, cheapers, what, what did I get wrong? And, and, and slowly, you know, every once in a while he'd sell one house and sell another. And he would go and he'd talk to these people. And he said, what, what finally happened? I built you the, 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 the kitchens you wanted and the granite top counters and the triple glazed windows and the sub-zero refrigerators and the bike. I gave you everything you wanted. And it took you a year to buy, what happened? And they said, well, you know, our, our daughter got married, and when she got married, she and her new husband moved, and they took the dining room table with them. What? And he kept hearing these stories about people, he kept hearing stories with a dining room table in it. And he kept saying, but you told me, you told me you didn't want a dining room. The kids are gone. You just want a little area of like a breakfast nook. 
You told me you didn't want a big dining room, so I didn't make a big dining room, and now you're talking about the dining room table. Well, what was the point of the story? Think about it. What does the dining room table signify in the family? It's like the arc of family memory. Every holiday, every Christmas, every birthday has been celebrated around that table. So even though these empty nesters didn't want a big dining room, that dining room table was not going to go to the dump. It was not going to go on eBay or Craigslist. Until that dining room table had a home, these people weren't going to move. Shit. So Bob redesigns his model home and he expands the dining area. He rents some clunky 1970s furniture. He puts the furniture in the model rooms. Sales immediately go up 22%. He keeps, he keeps exploring and investigating these stories of the transformation, the progress that these people are making. What are the barriers in the way of that, of that house move? This is what successful innovations do, by the way. They, they take the struggles and the anxiety from the lives of our customers and they take that away and they replace it with our solutions. They outsource the anxiety and the struggle and integrate it into our offerings. That's what they do. So the next thing he realized is there still was some friction in this process. And he, and he finds that well, what's the event when people go from talking about doing this to actually doing something about it? And what he found is it was often, and this is a little bit morbid, a little bit uh, black, uh, a health event in their immediate circle. You know, the neighbor had a heart attack, you know, maybe a, a, an uncle died. And so that forces a conversation between the husband and the wife. And it's, hey, I don't want you to have to deal with this by yourself. And I don't want to have to deal. So we better deal with this. So what does Bob do when he discovers that? He moves his advertising in the newspaper. He moves it from the real estate section, very expensive, he moves it to the uh, obituarios. <laughs> he, moves it to the, he moves it to the obituary section. 70% less cost, yeah? 37% increase in leads. They're very subtle ads. It was just, you know, time to talk, we can help. And, and the final thing that he does is he realizes that many of these older people are on fixed incomes, and so that the thought of moving costs is very disconcerting, makes them nervous. And also, many of them have attics full of stuff and basements full of boxes, and they've got to work their way through all these memories and these pictures and these, you know, it's going to take them forever. So the final thing, what does Bob do is he, he includes the price of moving and a year's free storage. And he'll bring the pod to you and you can go through your stuff. He includes moving and storage in the price of the home. Sales go up 17%. And he realizes, he said, we weren't in the business of building houses. We were in the business of transitioning and transforming lives. And that's what a jobs-based approach to innovation looks like. He wasn't competing with other home builders because he took a very, very different approach to the business, oh, this was the Goldman case, I already mentioned it. But this, I, this, I just want to, the, the point I want to make about the Goldman story is why in the world did Goldman Sachs come up with this consumer loan business that they project growing to being a $13 billion business? They don't, historically, if you're just an unwashed fellow like me, Goldman Sachs does not take my phone call. Last time I checked, you have to have $25 million of investable capital personally for them to be interested in you. So why would Goldman want this personal loan business? Why not like Citi or Wells Fargo? They've got huge consumer and retail loan business. Why, why wouldn't they be in this business? Why not? Who wants any guesses? What businesses does Citibank have and Wells Fargo have that Goldman Sachs does not have? I heard it. Credit cards. So if you see the world through the lens of 20% interest rates, this looks like a crappy business, right? And just to put a sharp point on it, the challenge of us as innovators is we process and see the external world through the lens of our existing businesses. And so we are incredibly prone to ignoring opportunities 
simply because we frame external phenomena through the lens of our existing capabilities. And we need to ask ourselves, when we actually make that mental shift from product focus to jobs focus, what are the opportunities that emerge? How different the world looks when we very productively, when we very productively reframe all of our products as services. All of our products are pulled into a customer's life in order for them to achieve desired progress and desired experiences. And when you understand these specific circumstances, what you realize is that those jobs to be done that occur in people's lives have very specific hiring criteria and firing criteria. And something that most entrepreneurs and most executives do not do with enough rigor or frequency is ask themselves, if someone's going to hire my product, what are they going to fire? They have to fire something. We are not inventing new dimensions of reality. So that could be a product that's doing the job poorly. It could be a bundle of products. Or it could be some non-consuming compensating behavior, like, like the small business owners that Scott Cook were selling to. Many of them weren't buying anything. They were doing it all in like paper and pencil. So it can be a product, a bundle of, pro of products, or some non-consuming compensating routine. But something has to get fired, and we should know what. We should know what's going to get fired, and we should know why. We should know the specific criteria that are relevant in those circumstances. Because when we have a clearly articulated job to be done, when we know the basis on which these people are navigating these circumstances and weighing options and making trade-offs, it gives us a very clear innovation spec of the dimensions of benefit, not just the functional dimensions, but the emotional experiences that we need to create and the social perceptions that we need to reassure that actually comprise the innovation brief for our offering. And when we do that, what we realize, just like back to that bank example in the beginning with my colleague Alyssa and banging her car in the parking lot, is that categories transform themselves. Our share gets much smaller. Competitors get much more diverse, right? But the path forward to create compelling new offerings gets much, much clearer. And that's the power of a compelling job to be done. And if you look at this schema, what you'll see is the power of a jobs-based approach, not only to create offerings, but to create organizations that take at its North Star, at its apex, a clearly articulated job to be done that, sim that fulfills this simple heuristic of when I am, help me so that I can. It's sort of a three-tiered heuristic we use to capture at a simple level a job to be done. When we have that well-articulated job to be done, we can build processes that perfectly deliver on those experiences. And we can animate those processes with resources people, technology, brands that enable those processes to work seamlessly and perfectly to deliver those, those outcomes and ultimately create metrics and uh, leadership structures and cultures that are all geared around creating these experiences for our customers. We're enabling them to create meaning, progress, and desired experiences. We as innovators are creating a future that is different from the past. It doesn't just show up. It is, it is ours to create. There has never been a better time or a better place to create the future than right here, right now. And you guys can do it. And I would just challenge you. I would challenge you. Don't simply create something that is successful, create something that is meaningful, and you can transform lives, you can transform communities, and you can change the world. Thank you very much.